Our third presenter is Catherine Scott Sturdivant. She's professor of history at Pikes. Can't hear me? Now? Okay. Catherine Scott Sturdivant, she's professor of history at Pikes Peak Community College, where she has been the lead American history teacher for about 25 years. She also teaches American Indian, Colorado, women's, west, southwest, and Pikes Peak regional history. Kathy works frequently with the Pikes Peak Library District and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum as a speaker. I have to read these things, Kathy. Okay. You know, I wouldn't, I can't say what, no. Um, you know, no, <clears throat> no, I'm not. <laughs> a consultant and an editor. She has authored two books and numerous articles and has won local, state, and national awards. See, I'm not in teaching anymore, so a whole day of talking, it's bad news. For teaching excellence, she has collaborated consistently on most of the PPLD regional history series books and symposia since they began. And she's my dear friend, Kathy. Good afternoon. <laughs> First, I want to thank all the preceding speakers. I've learned a lot. and. One of the things I wanted to thank them for, I also want to thank the Miller moth that was fluttering around the room. Did you notice him? I, for some reason, there was him to me. Um, it, it made me realize, as I was watching the Miller moth, at the same moment that I was hearing about traumatic brain injury, it made me realize again what Mike has been saying, how relative our definitions of disaster are. Because as Robin will recall, I had a student this semester for whom a disaster would be the attack of the Miller moths. That might sound frivolous. It might sound like the girl with her cell phone. Um, but this student had a legitimate reason to be very frightened of Miller moths, which was that when she was young, her brother drove into the garage, which was a restored barn, it was full of Miller moths. He opened the car window, so they all flew in. He slammed the doors, locked her in the car as a joke, and left. And when she told me that, I suddenly understood why on our field trip to the Sand Creek National Historic Site, she was freaking out because she saw a couple of Miller moths in the girl's outhouse. So I bravely, I'm still proud of this, I bravely took them on. And it turned out that there were hundreds of them, just flocks of them in this bathroom. And I shook the trash can and everything to get them out of there. And one of our brave young male students came in with his cap to drive the rest out. Do you remember the story that was in the news? It was actually just a couple of days later about a young girl who had a terrible accident up at the north end of town because there was a Miller moth in her car and she started to bat it or get afraid of it. I immediately texted my student and said, that wasn't you, was it? <laughs> and she said, no, but it helped teach her the lesson. And she then had a Miller moth in her car and was able to drive all the way home. <laughs> that was overcoming a disaster. On a much more serious note, I've had a number, actually a lot of students with traumatic brain injury and some of them have had great difficulty adjusting, and I couldn't partake longer in it because they couldn't stay in the class. They couldn't handle it, or they ended up just continuing to have problems and get help, I hope, mostly through Fort Carson. But I've also had some that were great successes, and I wanted to mention that people that I admire and will for the rest of my life, Latoya and Cade, and any of you who are watching, one of the things I noticed was that they have extremely solid marriages. And so I think that's both part and maybe an effect of how you deal with traumatic brain injury. But I hope we all learned a lot from that. Thank you, Dave Phillips, especially, for that very moving reading. I'm talking to you about what I thought of immediately when I heard the topic was disasters. Besides the fact that I wondered if some of my colleagues would think, oh, Kathy Sturdivant, yes, she's one of the great disasters of the Pikes Peak region. <laughs> I thought immediately of the Dust Bowl and of the Great Flood that happened simultaneously for this region in 1935 in particular. 
And I want to summarize a few things that you're going to see here. I want to make sure that it's clear that the Dust Bowl is man-made to a large extent. We've been going back and forth between man-made and natural disasters. Um, man-made in the sense that there was such a wonderful increase of farm prices because of World War I that people went out in what happened to be kind of a wet cycle on the Great Plains and planted wheat especially where that was marginal land that couldn't handle a lot of agriculture anyway. We're able to get enough out of that land for the good prices to make it worthwhile without irrigation, with just dry land farming. But that meant that they had chopped up the natural vegetation that held the topsoil down. And if there were no longer great prices, as was the case after World War I was over, that meant that land got abandoned at some point in the early 20s and no longer had any vegetation holding the topsoil down. So that's one of the key elements in the Dust Bowl. And then others is when the Depression hit agriculture 10 years sooner than it did the rest of the country, especially up to 23, a lot of farmers' reactions just naturally was to plant more and plant more and plant more, which of course once you go into the dry cycle is bad news. Another thing that I wanted to make sure we all understood, I don't think most people realize how much the Dust Bowl was in and of Colorado, of southeastern Colorado. W you know, I grew up in California and hearing about Okies and maybe Arkies, and I always thought of the Dust Bowl as more an Oklahoma panhandle, maybe Kansas phenomenon. But really, depending on which way the wind blows, which is usually west, the Dust Bowl started in southeast Colorado. And the center of it that we usually see on maps now is actually Boyce City, Oklahoma. So if you imagine beautiful downtown Boyce City, Oklahoma, which is in about the west center of the Oklahoma panhandle, and then start drawing ovals and circles from there, you have the Dust Bowl. And notice that the worst period of the Dust Bowl, particularly for our region, was in 35, and that Black Sunday called that because it blacked out everyone's vision and lives for at least 24 hours, was also in 1935. Notice, too, um, that the actual name Dust Bowl is credited to someone viewing it from Colorado, to an AP reporter, Robert Geiger in Denver, who had just been to the area, seen it, came back and described it as, as like a dust bowl. And of course, there are wonderful images or terrible images. I think that's, as Tim was suggesting in the beginning, that's one thing that's cool and exciting and intriguing about a disaster's theme is that we like to look at the pictures of terrible things happening. Um, and all of them are just horrendous. One of the unusual effects that I don't think that many people know about is static electricity during the Dust Bowl. The wind storms created a tremendous amount. We have plenty in this environment of dry wind anyway. And so some of the reports, and I'm a social historian and I love oral history, so I'm interested in people's memories of things. And some of the reports were about how people's cars were terribly damaged or they would just stall out. What people in the Dust Bowl region of southeast Colorado learned to do was drag chains or wires on the bottoms of their cars to ground the cars so the cars wouldn't stall out. Or another thing was just human contact. You didn't walk up to each other and shake hands in the Dust Bowl. You didn't put your hand on a doorknob. You had a cloth between you and the doorknob. People even reported seeing rather amazing electrical phenomena like a barbed wire fence suddenly sparking. Another thing to think about with the Dust Bowl was, of course, that the dust got in everything. The dust would black out everything for maybe a 24-hour period, like Black Sunday, but even if it weren't that bad, it would be in your lungs, it would be in your face, it would be brushing and blowing off your clothing. It would come in no matter what wet towel or anything else you tried to plug the window with. It would be so bad that it would strip paint um, off of anything that was outdoors or indoors. It would be so bad that it would break windshields. 
it would be so bad that you had to drive on all the country roads in particular, honking the horn the whole way for all of you who didn't know which way you were going on the road. It would derail trains. This is a view from east of Denver. And what's happening here is the beginning of one of the dust storms. This is 1937. The north winds would pick up the topsoil as they blew north. The south winds would meet them and lift it up higher. The west winds would then carry it along. If it got high enough, like on Black Sunday, it actually went so far that the dust from the central plains was found on the decks of ships in the Atlantic Ocean. Dust and pneumonia. Dust and pneumonia was sort of a gen general term for any of the respiratory ailments that people got during the Dust Bowl. It was often a fine silica dust, and so you could get silicosis, like black lung, like coal miners got. You also got all kinds of respiratory diseases and eye infections. And by the way, I identify with this. I'm prone to some of those things anyway, but I have had the same tendency toward eye infection every year since the Hayman fire. It's interesting how these things happen. And of course, the Red Cross came along and built shelters and offered hospitals and tried masks. People tried Vaseline up their noses. But anything they could do did no good. In fact, the masks would immediately become just heavily laden with mud as you tried to breathe through it. One of the things that many people remember about the Dust Bowl, because people today that I would get to interview or hear from are people who were children then. One of the things that they remember is how they had to survive out there, just like during a blizzard. And one of the things that they would do is tie each other together with ropes or hang on to a rope. So one of the more popular descriptions is from Harold Rutherford, who wrote about how his teacher if it got so dark and so bad a storm that the electricity went out and she knew it was going to be really bad, what she would have the children do, and I love this, I'm a teacher, I just think this is so cute. She would have them bring a rope and they would put it in a circle on the floor of the classroom tied at, e at the two ends in a knot so it's a circle of rope. All the children had to climb into the circle, grab the rope with both hands, then hold it up and go outside that way. And the circle of the rope would walk to each child's house to safely deliver that child home and then go on to the next and the next. Sometimes it was so bad that you would think they would drive, but that would be worse. And as you look at the pictures, know that one of the books that I use often is um, the American Guide series produced by the WPA. It's a wonderful 1930s, 1940s resource. And what they said about the folks they were interviewing in Colorado was, the wheat farmers of the ravaged Colorado Plains are a hardy, stubborn breed. Most of them stayed on, believing that droughts come in cycles, which they do. And one of the things that I like best in the American Guide series is they did oral history. And they recorded, no pun intended, the dry humor, actually pun intended, um, of these folks. That's how they would get through. And so they would tell stories like, have you heard the one about the prairie dog who dug a hole six feet in air? <laughs> Have you heard the one about the man who sandblasted his dishes clean by holding them up to the keyhole? <laughs> if Lady Godiva rode through town, now, even her horse wouldn't see her. <laughs> Part of my farm blew off to Kansas yesterday, so I guess I'll have to pay taxes there, too. <laughs> the wind that blew things through Wednesday came back yesterday over my place again and dropped some of my land back down. <laughs> a drop of water fell on a man's face, and we had to revive him by throwing two buckets of sand in his face. <laughs> or this is the most poignant. Think it's going to rain? <laughs> Hope so. 
Not for my sake, but for the children's sake. I've seen rain. <laughs> well, as if this weren't enough to deal with, in 1935, Colorado Springs had the flood that you've heard many people mention today, the Memorial Day flood. And by the way, that's the right Memorial Day, right? And many things happened. The weather, though, very strange. Nothing you've ever heard of, right? 2.34 inches in one hour, and that was downtown. Meanwhile, up north in the area of Monument, it hailed. It hailed so much that there were drifts of hail flowing down that were eight feet deep. As this all flowed down Monument Creek, Monument Creek flooded to the point that it was a quarter mile wide. It took out three bridges. Now, these would be the Rock Island Railroad Bridge, the Mesa Road Bridge, and the Colorado Avenue Bridge. It cost, here we go, John, where is he? <laughs> Insurance, right? It cost an estimated $52 million as of 1999 estimates. I didn't do the math to figure out what today's would be. And as it goes, I just have some amazing pictures of it to share with you. Spruce Street. The superintendent's house, Uinta Street Bridge site. Look at that. West Colorado Avenue. And if you look closely, you can see the twin spires of the antlers in the background. And look at this. This is an estimated 32 feet deep at one of the bridges that was taken out. Damage at Spruce and Boulder. This is Platt. And this is Colorado Avenue. And this is probably one of the most famous pictures from the flood. This is at Monument Valley Park, where really all the beautiful features that had been constructed for the park were pretty much destroyed. Well, you heard John refer to some of the solutions. We had a CCC camp. The New Deal came in just about the right time to help Colorado Springs with this damage. So the Civilian Conservation Corps set up at Templeton Gap. Now, of course, what they're dealing with, as you heard from John, is the Templeton Gap floodplain, not the monument one. We still get to deal with that. And this one always amuses me. It sort of looks like the whole CCC camp is one man. But this is a great one to show you what the Templeton Gap looked like at the time with the camp in it. And, and you saw an aerial view of that from John. The New Deal programs that helped out, particularly look at the Soil Conservation Service, because they taught farmers to deal with the Dust Bowl in advance by terracing and contour plowing, by using um, check dams, but one of the issues that you don't see there that I have to say is not really the New Deal's fault is that irrigation then became the solution that farmers went for. So if you go to the Dust Bowl region now or fly over it, you actually see a lot of green. You see a lot of center pivot irrigation. You see those funny squares with the circles in the middle. You see a lot of growing things. And the problem is, it is still the Dust Bowl. It is still the place where there isn't enough water to be doing that indefinitely. So there will be drought and shortages and serious problems. Subsidence, one of them. The New Deal also, it was the PWA who did a lot of the reconstructing. So things like uh, reconstructing some things at Glen Airy or Garden of the Gods or Shook's Run or the po hydroelectric power plant all came from the PWA. The NYA, the National Youth Administration, set up a camp in, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to see your sign, Nancy, um, set up a camp in Black Forest. And I love this one. They naturally picked Black Forest for the camp that would house tubercular people. But the NYA also was part of sort of an effort to have a female version of the CCC. The only problem with that is that 
the female camp sometimes did the laundry for the male camps. That one gets me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, one of the things that also comes out of the New Deal, though, is the writing project I told you is such a wonderful resource, and especially restoring Monument Valley Park, so that we did get some restoration, although the, obviously the Monument Creek is still an issue. Now, the big question that you've been hearing lots of us refer to, these things won't ever happen again, will they? <laughs> For example, dust storms. Dust storms don't threaten Colorado. Well, believe it or not, we are currently being deluged by one from Asia. There is a serious kind of dust storm that develops in Asia that is now dropping dark dust on the mountains of Colorado, which not only discolors it, which actually hurts the ski industry, but it causes an earlier melt, which means the water just comes down, overflows out of reservoirs, and we're going to have lots of lawsuits from towns that aren't getting the water that they need. Or how about what happened in Phoenix? Do you remember hearing about that? And doesn't it look a lot like the Dust Bowl pictures? It's still possible, particularly if we have a bad drought and the irrigation uh, is too expensive to continue. We've seen that happen in Southern California. Would floods ever happen here again? <laughs> well, emergency management experts say, ours, Colorado Springs's say, that the most likely kind of disaster that would affect a lot of people and cause a lot of damage in Colorado Springs is major flooding. So my suggestion is we learn. That's the hand of one of my students. Um, we learn to give Mother Nature the respect she deserves, as we've all been saying in one way and another today, to prepare to learn from history. I heard the word empathy used interestingly today because not only should we empathize with the people of the past who underwent all the disasters that we've been talking about and with each other when my house didn't have it as bad as your house did, but I heard about TBI taking away the ability to empathize and helping to cause these terrible things that happened for some of the veterans. And that made me realize again how important empathy is. And for me, in terms of dust bowl and flood, empathy often means, and I'm using a, a phrase that maybe is religiously grandiose, but I often think there but for the grace of God go I, that if it's happening to someone else, I need to realize tomorrow it could happen to me. And so let's look to the people we've been talking about today in all these situations and thank them and take those survivors as role models. Thanks very much. Um, Tim Blevins again here. Um, give Mike a little break. Uh, Kathy had asked me if my fall off of the stage was a planned stunt. Uh, well, of course it was. Um, uh, please just ignore the paramedics that happen to be on, on site here now. Uh, um, I'm here to introduce to you uh, the, the last four speakers and uh, kind of set this up because it's a little different than uh, the previous speakers in that we're experimenting a little bit. And some of you have made, maybe have heard of a presentation format called uh, Pecha Kucha. It has various pronunciations. That's the one we've decided because it's easiest to say. Uh, and the, for, the formal presentation format is called Pecha Kucha 2020. And what it is is 20 slides that are shown for 20 seconds each. So you have six minutes and 40 seconds to get through your presentation. So it's very rapid, it's very to the point, and uh, our executive director, Paula Miller, uh, has encouraged us to kind of experiment uh, with this. And so the next four speakers, who are all uh, Pikes Peak Library District staff members, are, are going to be doing their presentations in some variation of this, this format. And uh, I'm gonna introduce all four, four of them now. Uh, we have David Rasmussen, uh, who is currently an information specialist at the old Colorado City Library. And he previously worked at uh, the Pikes Peak Library District at the, as a lead branch assistant for the Fountain Library. Uh, David earned a BA in English and Speech 
and theater arts from St. Olaf College and has an MFA in theater arts. Um, David created the, the, he calls the group the Pechacuchins. Uh, Pamela Owens is a third-generation family historian who works at the Fountain Library as a clerk, local historian, and genealogy instructor. Pam is the designer and webmaster for fountaincolorado.blogspot.com and is documenting the town's history. Robin Hammett has resided in Colorado Springs for over 40, 40 years. Uh, Robin has worked in the facilities department of the Pikes Peak Library District for over 25 years. Uh, returning to school to seek a history degree, Robin is currently enrolled at the Pikes Peak Community College. Katie Rudolph is a special collections photo archivist here at the Pikes Peak Library District. Uh, she holds an MA in Library and Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and ha has attained archival certification from the Academy of Certified Archivists. Take it away, David. I have to remember to take a deep breath now because I don't get to breathe again for the next six minutes and 40 seconds. So here we go. Okay. More and more technology gone wrong accidentally or intentionally is becoming a devastating cause of human tragedy and disaster. It seems as long as we have progress, we'll suffer occasionally because of it. In 1888 in Fountain, Colorado, this cost was felt close to home. And in this case, not only was there mayhem in the history, there was also an unsolved mystery. Fountain, Colorado was first settled in the early 1860s, over a decade before Colorado Springs. Yet it was the coming of the Denver and Rio Grande, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, as well as other railroads that made it prosper as a ranching and agricultural community. Well, all of this went dreadfully wrong in the early morning hours of May 14th, 1888. We arrived at Colorado Springs about two in the morning. We left cars below the Denver and Rio Grande crossing to unload stock. I remember seeing the light in the caboose 10 minutes after I left the cars. When we were unloading the second stock car, a bum came up to me and said, where's the way car? I looked back and I could not see the cars. The cars were all heavily loaded. The, next, the car next to the caboose was a tank loaded with naphtha. Then came a car of household goods, then a car loaded with 25,550 pounds of giant powder, and last a car of sewer pipe. We took the front end of the train and started down the track to overtake the cars. When we heard the explosion, I knew they had collided with the number seven in Fountain. It was the shrill blast of the early morning Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe passenger engine that aroused the inhabitants of the little town of Fountain and brought my uncle and myself scrambling out of bed and for our clothes. We hardly got to our feet when an awful crash occurred and brought us to the realization that there'd been an awful wreck. The heavens seemed to be ablaze. As we came closer, we saw the very earth seemed to be a seething lake of fire. The night operator came rushing out of the depot and yelled, look out for powder. One of those cars is loaded with giant powder. The awful boom came and everything for me went dark. I didn't hear any noise. Everything just seemed to end and everything was no more. The next thing I knew I came to and I was pinned down and that was not the worst of it. I realized that the immense pile of wreckage that I was under was a fire. I was held fast like a man being burned at the stake. I could scarcely hear above the roar of the flames and the screams of the women and the calling of the men and could feel the awful heat of those flames that were now only a few feet away. I reached above my head with my hands. They came in contact with a pillar. I grasped and pulled with all my strength. I tore the skin and flesh from my ankle, but I freed myself. Yes, sir, and not a second too soon. The intense heat very nearly suffocated me and I lost no time getting away from that awful scene. A collision between four cars and a caboose of a freight train and a passenger train at Fountain caused a terrific explosion of a can of giant powder at 3.20 o'clock this morning. The explosion killed three persons instantly, mortally injured three more, and almost destroyed the entire town. It tore a hole 10 feet deep and 30 by 60 feet in the area in the earth, threw iron re rails 300 yards, scattered debris for a half mile, and demolished or damaged every structure in the place. The report was heard for 20 miles and awakened nearly every person in Colorado Springs. Its fearful effect can only be imagined and not described with any approach to the true horror of the situation. Mr. C.F. Smith, who was killed, was last seen on the roof of the depot where he had gone to fight the flames. When the explosion happened, he was thrown off the roof and the building fell upon him. Mr. H.W. Hutchins was standing on the tender of the engine. He was hurled to the ground by the explosion and buried under a mass of lumber and debris. 
The body of a man who is believed to have a brother living in Greenland, Colorado, was burned into an unrecognizable mass. He was in the caboose when the cars broke loose, and one person stated that he saw him on top of the cars as they entered Fountain, endeavoring to set the brakes. On every side were portions of the wreck which had been hurled by the explosion. Car wheels were split in two at a distance of 550 feet from the wreck. Rails were twisted as if they had been pipe stems. Pieces of iron and car wood were thrown with great violence against the houses. Buildings were collapsed, windows completely shattered, and the interior of every house badly demolished. In every house in town, the plaster had fallen down, covering the furniture. The Baptist church, which stood near the depot, was totally demolished, and the only remains of the structure is a large pile of lumber. State of Colorado, County of El Paso, and Inquisition held at Colorado Springs on May 16, 1888, before Isaac Davis coroner. We find that the railway employee took the usual precautions to prevent the cars from moving by setting the brakes, but they were let loose in some manner to the jury unknown. Three weeks later, Stockman Ira Furson made a statement to officials of the Santa Fe that there had been one more passenger on the caboose that night in addition to the two stockmen, and the man who died later identified as Frank Shipman. The extra passenger had boarded the train at Pueblo. A.C. Dodge, the other stockman, corroborated the report of Furson. To all appearances, the meeting was purely accidental, but their recognition was mutual, and from their conversation, the stockmen were led to believe the two had an old grudge between them. During the ride to Colorado Springs, the two had come to blows several times. When Ferrison left the caboose in Colorado Springs, the men had renewed their quarrel. Eventually, Shipman's body was exhumed, and it was found that the skull just above the right eye was crushed, but without the skin being broken. The characteristics of the wound suggested it had resulted from a blow from a heavy blunt instrument. From this new evidence, the railroad authorities theorized the unknown had murdered Shipman. The railroad employed detectives in an attempt to find the unknown man. He was described as heavy set with a pockmarked face. An investigator located the unknown in Glenwood Springs. Information was slow to reach Santa Fe authorities, however, and the mystery man departed and was heard from no more. Can we ever escape the inevitable disasters that come with technological advancement? Probably not. But history teaches us that although these tragedies occur, we will survive them. And while they may be the device of humanity's worst villains, often they manifest what is otherwise most heroic in human nature. The banks of the Fountain Creek were settled in about 1859 by Thomas Owen and the Locks. An old trail follows the creek and the Terrells established a stagecoach station there in the mid-1860s. Fountain was platted in 1871. And here you can see the creek on the left-hand side and the railroads on the right. The Imes family settled on homestead land on the west bank of the Fountain Creek in the 1860s, and when Mary passed away in 1871, she was buried on the family land. Fountain grew up around its railroad stations and became a shipping point for ranchers in the southern part of El Paso County. Others were buried on the Imes land, including Henry Hutchin, who died in the 1888 explosion, and Wallace Loomis, who lost a leg in the explosion but survived. Years later, the Imes family donated the land to the city of Fountain, and it became the Fairview Cemetery. The Pettengill Monument at the Fairview Cemetery is imposing, though weathered, it bears the names of Anna Pettengill, who died in 1896 at the age of 37, and James Pettengill, who died at the age of 26 in, in 1902. Although not usually considered disasters, the death of a family member at a young age was certainly viewed as a personal tragedy. March 23, 1896, the Rocky Mountain News reports, the suicide of Mrs. A.M. Pettengill is the subject of much comment here. She had not been living happily with her husband for several years, and since her divorce last January, she had been plotting to take her life. On the day the divorce was final, Anna made an attempt to poison herself, but was prevented by her friends. Several times since, she has threatened to take her life, but Mrs. Steen, who was her boarder, became so accustomed to these threats that she lost vigilance. While Mrs. Steen was away, the desperate woman took her life. March 26th. 
Coroner Marlowe left for Fountain today to investigate the death of Mrs. Pettengill, who was at first supposed to have committed suicide. But the newspaper said there are some mysterious circumstances concerning the death. March 27th. Coroner Marlowe held an inquest at the graveyard over the body of Mrs. Pettengill, who committed suicide there last Saturday. After a thorough examination of the witnesses, the jury reached the following verdict. Anna died of arsenic poisoning by her own hands. A large number of witnesses were called, among them being Mr. Abram Pettengill and Mrs. Steen. It was shown that the two were about to be married. It was this knowledge that caused Anna to commit the act. One witness testified Anna had told her Mrs. Steen was the cause of all her trouble. The coroner did not take up the body. Arsenic has been used as a poison for centuries and was a favorite murder weapon during the Middle Ages. It is extremely toxic when ingested and is said to be colorless, odorless, and tasteless. March 27th. Although the jury reached a verdict of death by arsenic poisoning, there is still some mystery in the minds of many citizens of the town, and it would not be surprising if a number of prosecutions grew out of the present feeling. The April 6th Denver Evening Post reported Abram Pettengill, husband of the woman who recently committed suicide at Fountain, was married last week in Leadville to the co-respondent in the divorce, Miss Ida Steen. No further mention was found of Anna, Abram, or Ida Pettengill in the Colorado newspapers, so I turned to the census for more information. The, 19, uh, the newly married couple moved away and was living in Wyoming by 1900, and this census will provide you with information on the birthplace of each individual and their parents. We can see that son Frank was born in Colorado, and his parents were born in Indiana and Ireland. And his brother Alfred, who was born just two months before his parents' divorce, his parents were from Indiana and Kansas. So who is Alfred's mother? Who was born in Kansas? Hmm. The west side of the monument um, reads, in memory of my darling husband, James Arthur Pettengill, born 1876, died 1902. James was not found on any census, but I assume he is Anna's son because he's on the monument with her. The inscription on James' side of the monument reads, in this rifted rock, I am resting. Safely sheltered, I abide. There are no stones to molest me while in the cleft I hide. Why did John James die so young? I couldn't find an obituary. The east side of the monument bears a portion of the poem, Our Heroes, which was a staple of the Locomotive Engineer's Manual in about 1900. Are they not heroes? Have they not died? Under their engines side by side? Have they not stood at the throttle and brake? and gone down to their death for their passenger's sake. Gertrude Lawrence, who appears on the north side of the monument, was mentioned in the history of Colorado as the daughter of David Sella Fountain and the wife of Arthur Pettengill, who was killed in a railroad wreck on the Santa Fe Road. She later married Joe Lawrence, and her parents also were killed by a train just north of Fountain. But that gave me a lead. The Colorado Springs Weekly Gazette of 1902 reported a train wreck near Denver. Two locomotives plowed through a string of wild freight cars before derailing and plunging down an embankment, crushing Pettengill and Engineer Barnhart. The two locomotives and their crew took the full brunt of the collision, miraculously sparing all of the passengers from serious injury. Calm, undisturbed, be the peaceful repose of the men who have died in their overclothes. All honor to him, but forget not those who have lived and died in their overclothes. Would be sweet to know when they're laid to rest, with hands folded silently over their breast, that a woman would come to their graves once a year, bringing wreaths of flowers and a tear. I hope you enjoyed the story. The Antlers Hotel was the dream child of General William Jackson Palmer, and for Kathy's benefit, our father who are in the intersection. <laughs> it was General Palmer, along with Dr. William Bell, Dr. S.E. Solly, and William Jackson, got together and decided to build this resort hotel, 
It opened in 1883, 1883 at the cost of just shy of $3 million in today's funds. Palmer put up a majority of that money as well as the four acres it stood on. It boasted 75 rooms, a four-room bridal suite, billiard and music rooms, central steam heat, gas lighting, and a hydraulic elevator. In 1890, it was expanded to the south and nearly doubled in size. Calamity would come on October 1st, 1898, at 2.30 in the afternoon. At the Denver and Rio Grande Freight Depot at South Sierra Madre, a uh, fire started under the south, uh, under the south uh, freight platform in a, in a pile of trash and, and blown in uh, tumbleweeds. It soon engulfed the building and soon engulfed railroad cars nearby. There were 10 rail cars nearby. The Manitou branch of the, uh, uh, the controlled switching in, in the yard moved the rail cars out, but two cars loaded with explosives they were not able to move in time. Soon, a rail car full of gunpowder, kegs of gunpowder, about the size of a five-gallon pa uh, five pail of paint, exploded and sent sparks and shards of rail car falling down on Christie Fowler Lumber Co Company across the street, as well as the Gulf Railway Depot, and they immediately caught fire. The whole area started cons uh, in uh, encompassed in flames, and a, f and a uh, wind coming from the southwest was blowing at 40 to 50 miles an hour, quickly fanning the flames across the area. Soon, the businesses in the area started catching fire. The Diltz uh, blacksmith shop and the Hassel Iron Works were some of the next ones to go. They were along the Huerfano Avenue, which is actually now Colorado Avenue. Another building that actually was spared by the fire was the Seldom Ridge Brothers Warehouse at the corner of Huerfano and, and uh, Sierra Madre. They lost a, a large bunch of hay next to their building, but they actually, their building didn't go up. Soon, within an hour, the flames reached uh, Newton Lumber Company, which was right across the street from the Antlers Hotel to the south. The sides of the building started blistering. They tried everything they could do. They had about an hour before they reached the Antlers Hotel, and they started moving the furniture out. And they you saw the picture earlier that had all the furniture piled in the street. They were moving the furniture out of the building to try to save it, but they couldn't do it. Soon the building went up in flames. It the uh, Antlers Hotel encompassed in flames very, very quickly. The uh, uh, call went out within 30 minutes of the fire's beginning to Denver and Pueblo for steamers to help put out the fire. Colorado Springs did not own a fire apparatus other than horse-drawn carriages, horse-drawn ladder trucks, uh, man-towed uh, hose reels. They did not have a power apparatus to put this fire out. So the fire went spread really quickly. This is the extent of the fire. You can see the fire start, started down here. These are the locations of the lumber yards, including the Newton Lumber Yard, right across the street from the Antlers Hotel. As, as they pulled the stuff out of the Antlers, Antlers Hotel to try to save Dr. Solly's house, which is right here, they took the blankets from the hotel and hung them down the side of the building and wet them down to save Dr. Solly's house to keep it, the fire from spreading north. And what helped keep the fire from spreading east was that the, most of these buildings along this side were, were brick and stone, so they didn't catch fire, and they sprayed water down them to uh, keep them from igniting. This is actually a layover of where the fire is today. This is the Penrose Library right here. Dr. Solly's house basically sat right at the entrance of the Penrose Library's parking lot. This is the extent of the fire. And actually, I got to looking at this picture, and I believe that is the Seldom Ridge Warehouse right there that survived the fire. And here's a series of pictures. This is the remains of the Gulf Railway Depot, as well as here's a few more remains of the uh, Antlers Hotel. I love this picture. This is the picture of the Antlers Hotel before the fire. Now you see it. Now you don't. Totally burned to the ground. General Palmer was still in England at the time when this uh, fire took place, and before the smoldering ruins were even cold, he had t telegraphed back to Colorado Springs that he planned to rebuild. Also, the businessmen in, in Colorado Springs were... Uh, 
uh, not too happy that we didn't have fire apparatus. So within uh, two weeks after uh, the fire, the city council approved the purchase of a fire engine, a steam pumper, and by the end of November, they actually took delivery of it. There were, four, there were 16 lawsuits, and uh, at this, uh, they were consolidated into uh, four or five lawsuits, all against the Denver and Rio Grande for the trash accumulation underneath the loading dock and for having freight cars loaded with explosives within the city limits. They were settled for, oops, they were settled for uh, 1.2 million, and I love the f fact of the $250,000 in lawyers' fees and today's money. <laughs> This is the steam pumper that they purchased in no the November of that year. That actually, the, and the Colorado Springs Fire Department still owns this. It's in the museum on Printers Parkway. So if you want to see it, it's absolutely a beautiful, beautiful piece of equipment. And like I say, General Palmer vowed to rebuild before the fire, the embers were even starting. And then shortly later, construction started on the new Antlers Hotel that opened in 1903. Thank you. Following World War II and continuing into the 1970s, urban renewal was a term used to describe public efforts to modernize aging cities. The Colorado Urban Renewal Law of 1958 established a program of land purchase and demolition in blighted urban areas. It also allowed for towns and cities to establish urban renewal authority boards. Colorado Springs didn't establish an, an urban renewal authority until 1970, but many historic buildings were raised during the 1960s in the spirit of modernization. Nearly 50 years have passed since many of these demolitions, and today's downtown landscape prompts the question, was what we gained worth what we lost? <laughs> The Helen Hunt Jackson home at 228 East Kiowa Street was completed in 1873 by Winfield Scott Stratton. William Sharpless Jackson and his wife, writer Helen Hunt Jackson, uh, lived in the home. Initially, the home faced Weber Street, but Helen insisted it be lifted and turned to face the southwest towards her beloved Cheyenne Mountain. In 1961, the city purchased the home as a site for a police building. Before its demolition, four, ro four rooms were preserved by the Pioneers Museum, and the home was torn down in just three and a half hours in October 1961. The Alta Vista Hotel opened as a boarding house at 118 North Cascade Avenue in 1889. It featured steam heat, a freight elevator, and gas and electric lights. Most famously, Nikola Tesla stayed here in 1899 and 1900 while he was conducting experiments. Owner H. Hoyt Stevens eventually retired and leased the hotel to other firms, but in 1934, at the age of 84, he remodeled and reopened the hotel. In March 1963, all but the first floor of the hotel was um, raised, and by the early 1970s, it was completely demolished to make way for an office building. General William Jackson Palmer opened the Antlers Hotel in 1883, naming it for a large collection of deer and elk trophies. Centrally located on Cascade Avenue, the hotel had a hydraulic elevator, central steam heating, and gas lighting, which gave it notoriety as a luxurious establishment. After the Antlers was destroy destroyed by the fire in 1898, General Palmer pledged to rebuild the hotel. Frederick Sterner, an architect known for his work on the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia, was hired to design um, a hotel in an Italian Renaissance style, complete with decorative iron balconies and a piazza. The hotel featured an Italian marble staircase, terrace, sun parlor, barbershop, billiards room, and grand ballroom. The 230 guest rooms had custom English wallpaper, mahogany furniture, temperature control units, and telephones. 
The hotel opened in 1901 and operated until September 20th, 1964. The hotel was purchased by the El Pomar Investment Company to make way for Antlers Plaza, a modern downtown business complex. Hotel furnishings, windows, light fixtures, and even toilets were removed and sold. On October 8, 1964, the last portion of the hotel was demolished, and the Antlers Plaza Hotel opened in its place in March 1967. In 1909, C.B. Adams and Albert Mark Scheffel opened the Mark Scheffel Motor Company at 122 North Cascade Avenue. In 1914, they bought land on the corner of East Kiowa and North Cascade, the former site of the Count James Portales home. They made plans for a large auto repair and sales complex. By 1916, the Mark Scheffel Motor Company boasted the largest floor space of any garage in the country. The Spanish-style structure was built of concrete, and its exterior featured three half-size ceramic replicas of 1914 Cadillacs made by the Denver Mantle and Tile Company. Inside, the garage was equipped with a showroom for six cars, a cigar sales room, a 12,000-gallon gasoline tank, tire cellar, and machine shop. It also held offices, an opulent women's restroom, and a men's recreation room. In 1966, the Mark Scheffel building was torn down to make way for the new Penrose Public Library. In 1970, the Colorado Springs Urban Renewal Effort, or CURE, became certified by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. By 1972, City Council named Urban Renewal at the top of their priority list, and they pr approved a controversial redevelopment project called the Alamo Plaza Urban Renewal Project in a four-block business section of downtown. Proponents of the project saw it as an opportunity to bring parking, retail, and office space to an area that had a pretty seedy reputation at the time. Many business owners opposed the plan because it would demolish instead of rehabilita rehabilitate buildings and relocate businesses. The Alamo Plaza project was made a ballot issue in the April 1973 election, and voters approved the project. Gold mining millionaire James Ferguson Burns hired local architects Douglas and Hetherington to design a state-of-the-art theater for the city of Colorado Springs. The Burns Theater was engineered for superior acoustical and visual clarity, with sweeping balconies supported by outside walls instead of pillars. The stage was framed by neoclassical sculptures and red velvet drapes. An electrical panel controlled lighting and backdrops. Hand-painted Italian murals adorned the ceiling. Floors, pillars, and staircases were made of polished Italian marble, and lavatory fixtures were crafted in burnished brass. The theater opened on May 8, 1912. In 1927, it was converted to a movie house, and in 1933, it was renamed the Chief Theater. In October 1972, the theater's landlord, the Exchange National Bank, declared the building hazardous and closed it on Halloween. While the bank's structural report deemed the theater unsafe, the State Historical Society's report found the building to be sound and restoration feasible. Now, despite the conflicting reports, the bank opted to demolish the building. Although the, land, the Landmarks Preservation Council had previously headed off demolition of the El Paso County Courthouse, they could not convince city council um, to make the theater's fate a ballot issue. Demolition of the Burns Building began in May 1973 and took several weeks to complete. Today, nearly 40 years later, a parking lot stands on the site of the Burns Theater. Giving weight to the question, was what we gained equal to what we lost? No. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for the Pikes Peak region, many historic buildings have been preserved with the help of public policy, preservation organizations, and concerned citizens. But what will the future hold? Certainly the potential exists for popular attitudes to once again view historic structures as out of date, inefficient, and unprofitable, rather than the buildings that define the character of our community and provide a tangible link to our past.